Welcome back to the show. Great to be back. The last time I saw you uh, and had you on was December 2015. That was 40 years ago. A very oh, different time. Amen. Uh, you were gearing up for Hillary going up against Donald Trump. The party was aiming at something different. You had a different vision, different purpose. As you said, it f- feels like 40 years. Mm-hmm. Everything has changed. What is the DNC looking to do differently this time? Win. And win everywhere. Uh, I, w- I had a 100% confidence interval that uh, we were going to make history again on November the 8th, 2016. I don't think I was alone. And I woke up the next day and uh, said I could cower in a corner. I could do something about it. And I think when we have a Democratic Party that's firing on all cylinders, Mm -hmm. uh, we win at scale, up and down the ballot. And so I ran for this job, and I've taken this job with an eye toward making sure we lead with our values, we communicate what we stand for, and we're the party that's fighting for opportunity and fairness for everyone. And then we run campaigns, and we build relationships. Politics um, became way too transactional. You know, there's a distinction, Trevor, between... Uh, what I call mobilizing and organizing. Mobilizing is that sprint, that uh, two or three month sprint before an election. Organizing is building those relationships. All politics is personal, President Obama. How do do you, how do you build personal relationships with 24 presidential candidates out there? (laughs) Like you, you, you have to admit it's become a bit of an issue where you have so many candidates right now. Do you think that's good for the party, or do you think that's something that you need to whittle down as quickly as possible? Oh, I think that's a first-class challenge to have. I had the privilege of working with the vast majority of these candidates, and they're wonderful people. And everyone running for president believes that every person in this country should have access to safe, affordable health care, mm-hmm. quality, affordable health care. Every person running for president believes that... Uh, believes that climate change is real and we need to take swift, bold action. Everyone running for president understands that these attacks on women, on immigrants, on communities of color are are attacks on the fabric of our democracy. And so there's a unity of purpose here. And I don't think it's my place as the chair of the DNC to winnow the field. What it is my place to do is make sure everybody gets a fair shake because all but one aren't going to make it to the mountaintop. And our goal is to make sure the process is fair to everybody so that everyone feels like they got a fair shake. And how do, you, how do you decide what's fair, though? How do you how do you come in and say this is fair and this isn't fair? Because right now you've had to make rules about how to get, you know, onto the debate stage because everyone wants to run for president. So now the the idea is if you are polling below two percent, I believe it is one percent. One percent. You cannot. End. But why one percent? That seems like a such such an arbitrary. Is that? Just because well, what, it's better than zero? Well, <laughs> zero... The, the only thing lower than one would be zero. Right. In which case, you could announce you're running for president tonight. I am. Uh, yes, I am. Okay, I'm running for go. president. Oh, that's I'm, I'm pulling totally at zero. And one. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, we did a lot of listening uh, when I uh, entered this job, and we spoke to a lot of folks, including people who had run for before. What we didn't do is speak to folks who were either running or thinking about running because we didn't want to create an impression that we were putting a thumb on the scale. And we created an unprecedented layer of access to the debate stage. We've never before in the history of the Democratic primary had a a grassroots fundraising threshold. So we always use polling. And my concern with focusing solely on polling to get on the debate stage is that 18 months out, polling often measures uh, no more than name ID. And so we wanted to create another pathway to demonstrate our commitment to the grassroots. And so... It, we used a 1971 law that established public funding for campaign finance. We modernized it, and we created a grassroots fundraising threshold. So if you had 65,000 unique donors or you had uh, 1% in the polls, uh, you could potentially get access to the debate stage. And actually, 14 candidates out of the 20 uh, met both thresholds. Right. And Uh, Our goal was to make sure we gave people a fair shake. We gave them notice back in February, so they had plenty of time to move forward. And then we used random assignment, because, again, I didn't believe in JV varsity. I wanted to make sure that... Everyone uh, gets on that stage, stage. and it's random. And you're going to love the folks you meet. I mean, my my goal for folks, I want you to date many people at the same time in the primary season, fall in love... (laughs) You know, speed date, do whatever you need to do, fall in love with many people. Yes. And then when we have our nominee, uh, fall in line, because this is the most dangerous president in American history, and our unity is absolutely our greatest strength as a party. 
Here's the concern. The concern some people would have, to use your analogy, is if you fool around too much, you may not be able to settle down. You know, you get to that <laughs> point where you, you're now told to be with one person, and then you're like, oh, man, but being out and about was so much fun. Am I ready to do this? And we, we saw that in the previous race where you, you noticed a fracture in the party mm -hmm. because people felt like Bernie wasn't given a fair shake. In many ways, you're in a thankless job. You know, there are those... I've been told who, that. Yeah, you, you're, you're in a position where you have to do what is good for the DNC and the Democratic mm -hmm. Party, but you have Bernie fans who say, hey, this was not fair to him last time. How do you, how do you fix that? And then you have mm -hmm. establishment candidates who go, well, Bernie's not even a real Democrat. He pops in when he likes. Why don't we maintain our rules and our structure like superdelegates? You've now weakened the power of superdelegates, and you faced a lot of backlash for this. Bernie people are enjoying it. How do you find that balance? And do you think that after it all, the Democrats will be able to mm -hmm. come together this time? Well, let me answer your last question first. Absolutely. And here's why. Because when, we, when I came into this job in February of 2017, we convened a very, very wide table. We talked about uh, the issue of superdelegates. We talked about how do we build a Democratic Party mm -hmm. that can be, again, the party of the people? How do we address concerns that led to the challenges that we saw in 2016. We've, we've got to come out of this convention, and we will, uh, united as a party. And so because everybody had skin in the game, everybody had an opportunity to be heard, we ended up with wide-ranging reforms. And you talked about superdelegate reforms. I think that is one of the many things we did to return power to the people. Having this debate threshold where you can uh, have grassroots fundraising, another very, very concrete statement to uh, voters that we value you. Uh, you look at what we did with primaries and uh, caucuses. I want to make sure, and our goal was to make sure that everybody who's eligible to vote actually goes out and casts their vote. So we made, we, we created incentives to have more primaries and less caucuses. Mm -hmm. And now we have six states that were caucus states four years ago that are going to be primary states. I think that's great for democracy because more people participate. More and what people all are, these... More people are definitely going to participate because... Yeah. It just came out today, um, the Wall Street Journal, I think, reported that President Trump says he intends to live tweet all of the debates, <laughs> right? Which I, which I think is a first for a president in ever. Um, so you have him trash talking while this is gonna be happening live. Are you preparing for this? If not, I have an idea. Why not, <laughs> why not have like a screen on stage with his tweets and then like people can respond and then we see how they would handle Trump one on one? What, <laughs> do you have any preparations or is your idea more about getting rid of Donald Trump out of the conversation and yeah. focusing on the issues that voters want to hear about? You know what, we talked to the networks at length and here's what I said. I want to focus on the issues. We don't ha want to have any discussions about hand size. We want to talk about health care. <laughs> we want to talk about women's reproductive health. We want to talk about the fact that Lady Liberty, two miles from here, is exactly who we are mm -hmm. as an American people. We want to talk about climate change. We want to talk about the issues that animate people. We want to talk about the fact that too many people are working three jobs and not making ends meet. We want to talk about the assaults on the labor movement and what we can do to strengthen the labor movement. Because when we have a strong labor movement, we have strong unions, we have a strong middle class. And we've been very clear with the networks that uh, we've actually talked about uh, the fact that Trump might try to uh, disrupt uh, can the, the debates by mm -hmm. uh, injecting himself. And you know what? I am quite confident that we're going to be talking about the issues. Because the American people are fed up with this president. They're tired of... Presidents are supposed to have your back. They're supposed to make you... Uh, feel less stress in your life. And chaos is his middle name. And we have to make sure as Democrats that we are demonstrating to folks that we have your back on all the issues that matter most. If you've got diabetes or some other pre-existing condition, we're fighting to keep to have, have you keep your health care. That's magical. And Any pre-existing condition, including small hands, will be covered. Thank you so much <laughs> for being on the show. <laughs> Tom Perez, everybody.